Uh, and some ideas, again, these are all just <coughs> recommendations, things that you can think about doing. Um, you know, we recognize that all schools and school districts and uh, have different resources and the ability to, to do different things. And so, um, you know, whatever, whatever your situation is in terms of resources, um, as far as money or, or uh, partnerships with other, you know, agencies, Take some of this stuff and, and, uh, and, and relay this onto your staff. Um, you know, we want to secure the door, lock, wedge, or heavy furniture right in front of the door. Um, if possible, cover the windows and secure all the entry points and openings. Uh, once, the, once the room is secure, get out of sight and stay quiet. Um, the, it's real important that um, you, again, going back to that other slide, take care of yourself and the children there that are in your room. <laughs> Uh, stay off the phones unless called and silence all devices. We recognize that kids are going to use uh, their devices as soon as they can, depending on the grade level, obviously, but they're going to get on uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is the newest one I think my kids are doing. Um, and you want to make sure that it's all, you know, you're not on the phone and not communicating out uh, and waiting for law enforcement or the all clear signal to be given. Uh, there will be times where you get the all clear signal and you'll dismiss this as normal, uh, depending on the, the, the gravity of the incident. And there are times where you'll get an officer with a key that'll come with a staff member or on their own and open the door, go in and, and have you um, evacuated. Escape. Uh, we put this in here because uh, there are times when uh, the, you know, your classroom may or, or a particular bu building or room may be on the far end of the campus and you know many of our schools have this where we have a uh, pedestrian gate out to a neighborhood um, you know if it's if you haven't heard the lockdown drill and you know things are going bad you know do what you can get out out the door and uh, get in you know escape out of there um, there's no sense in being locked down if you can't have an easy escape and you've already had a pre-planned escape route in your mind and, it, and it's, a, it's a safe way to go. Um, obviously, if you hear lockdown signal, lockdown, and uh, you know, follow directions from the officers and uh, the 911 operator if you're calling 911 at that point. Um, again, just be mindful that we want you to remain calm or as calm as possible uh, temp and know that help is on the way. Once those calls are made, like Sergeant Wynn said, is, you know, everybody's activated. Uh, again, I was at the, the incident at Rio Casadero, and there were hundreds of people there to, to help. And so help is on the way, and when we start going through the, other, you know, the process of evacuation and, and things like that, we'll get into how we do it in Elk Grove, but um, it's, it's real important to follow the direction of the officers when we're, when we're there. And, and, and for the, again, leaders of the districts or the principals of the schools in the room, um, we will return your school back. You don't, you certainly don't, um, you don't want to handle uh, or be in charge of one of these chaotic scenes and we do this for a living and, and so we're willing to do that for you and give it back. And like Sergeant Wynn said, you don't want him educating your kids either. Okay. Um, got an after-school program I'm putting together. <laughs> <laughs> this is really, I, I want you to know, this is really difficult for me because I'm kind of a walk-around guy, but um, they have a recording thing going on here. So um, temporary transfer of campus authority, can, this is what you can expect from that. And what we mean is, is, is it, when we get the call that a, a crisis is happening at your campus, um, we're, we're the ones responsible to make sure that it ends well or as, as best as we can and and we want to um, take that for you and not and not have you take on that additional um, thing that you may not be trained in doing this is kind of what uh, here's a, a photo of what this is the chaos I was talking about who wants who in the room wants to handle that other than the chiefs and the <laughs> lieutenants um, you know, that's, that, that is chaotic. Those are a lot of first responders coming, um, probably some folks in there that have escaped, and uh, we do bring uh, some controlled chaos to, to, uh, to what we do. Um, well, we'll activate a command post so we get a central location of uh, a person in charge, a team in charge. We use um, 
standard emergency management system. And this came out of, uh, really out of the Oakland fires in 91, where it was, it was learned, well, 25 were killed and almost 3,000 homes lost, but there was no coordination between agencies. And so that's, what, that's kind of where this came from. Um, again, we use the incident command system, which was talked about a couple of times, where um, we have, uh, you know, folks from, uh, that, that will be in charge of a, a scene commander, and then it kind of breaks out from there, and people in charge of different aspects of the emergency. Um, we do that uh, mutual, we also do it through mutual aid agreements um, with all the agencies, and I, you know, we're talking a lot about police here, but don't forget the fire component and the medical response component, that is, that is part of it. And that's where you get into the interagency uh, coordination, the unified command, where you have uh, folks from all different uh, disciplines in, in crisis response, uh, assisting with um, taking control of the situation and in doing the things we need to do to resolve it, as well as the aftermath. Um, at this command system and the command post, we will, um, it'll, they'll also direct notification, evacuation, reunification, and when communication can occur. Uh, incident command post, it's just kind of, uh, kind of a shot of, you see just different agencies, public works, uh, you know, Highway Patrol, different agencies there working together. Again, we're all trained the same, and we all work together, and everybody knows how these things work once we get there and we determine who's in charge. So um, schools, uh, personnel's role in the, in the command post, the unifying command post. Um, we, we work on, on an assumption that, and it, we, this is like the third time we've said it, um, so I don't mean to repeat myself, but we work on the assumption that personnel that are, going, are, are at schools are going to be um, victims. That's why, we, that's why we went there is because there was an emergency, something going on, uh, both physically and emotional uh, victims. So if the principal comes to us and says, uh, my art teacher is our communications guy on our campus or, or is responsible for this area, uh, communications guy may, or your art teacher may not be available. In the Sandy Hook thing, for weeks we didn't see any school administrators making any comments to the media um, you know, it, it was it was the local aid, local first responder agency. So, just recognize that they that we understand that there will be people uh, physically and emotionally unable to help, and that's and that's okay. We we'll bring people to help take care of the situation. Uh, again, at at our incident in Elk Grove that I, we were involved in, um, you know, it's kind of a small school. I knew a lot of the teachers there, and the ones, I'll tell you, the ones that I thought that would be up front saying, Rich, can I help, uh, were the ones under the desk. And that's okay. That's just how they deal with it. Um, well, one lady teacher was, I thought, oh, she's, I, we can't ask her for help. And uh, she was the one that really assisted us in getting the kids out and evacuated. So you just don't know, uh, but we work under that assumption. Uh, placement of the per school personnel is going to be uh, at the command post. It's going to depend on the need of what we need to get done and, uh, and who is available. School administrators may be placed at the incident command post, and that's to help coordinate, um, like they said in the earlier presentation, communication to the public and things like that. So, uh, and, and or whatever else we might need, uh, school buses um, to evacuate, uh, just a, a number of things. Um, and then any other unaffected specialized staff, like your, your, your <coughs> maintenance workers, um, school psychologists, all, all those folks that, that may be unaffected may be asked to assist with communication, evacuation, and reunification. This photo just demonstrates how quickly uh, things will happen and how many cameras will come out of nowhere uh, on an incident. And uh, again, that one of the assumptions that we work under is that we're, that's a component of what we have to deal with in the, in the unified command at the command post is uh, determining where to put those folks. But this is, again, just a, an, an idea of what you will find as you walk out of your incident. Uh, media will be probably everywhere. And, and not only uh, local, but national media will, will, will be there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about communication. And the um, what what you can what we expect and, and what what will happen and the important pieces of it. 
Um, we're, we're, we expect that you'll be prepared to receive and communicate accurately, timely information, um, whether it's uh, within your own district in your own uh, communication department or for your small district like Superintendent Gordon said the help of um, the County Office of Education's communications department um, But it's really really important to get accurate Information out to staff the public and media and parents and guardians as soon as possible um, The other real big piece here is is that there's coordination between uh, first responder agencies and the schools whether it's a district um, the school district or you know uh, but but about the about the incident so that there's one message um, you you know not, not very good with if you have the police department saying one thing the fire department saying one thing and the school saying a different thing um, and that's part of our unified command and getting the accurate information out um, again you know, just another photo of, of what that kind of looks like. You can see CNN's there, um, lots of media. And uh, they talked about earlier in the earlier presentation about getting what information to get out as soon as possible, but um, we'll, t we'll talk a little bit more about that in reunification and evacuation. Part of, part of the unified command is having somebody, a public information officer, and um, yeah, it, you know, it, it'll, it'll do, obviously we want to get information out to parents pretty quickly, um, just because that, those, those folks are gonna be on your doorstep before you know it. And um, you know, so, so yes, there, there is consideration, um, but, it, but it, it's all gonna depend on what's going on at the time. And um, there, there may be a time where we, after we get parents notified, uh, we want to let staff know what's going on first because we want to get them evacuated, let's say. Uh, but there may be a time where we have to do the, you know, have to talk to the media before we give staff the, you know, information. Because we when we're, we're, we're evacuating them to, we may be huddling them up there and giving them the information. So it's all going to depend on the incident. Uh, but certainly, uh, it, you know, it's important. And that's why uh, having somebody from the school district at the Unified Command Post uh, offers that up and, and, and you know, pr helps prioritize as well. Um, one of the other expectations for evacuation reunification is a ex general expectation in law enforcement in general uh, that the schools will be able to assist with the evacuation of the school site and pr are primarily responsible for reunification of children with, the, with their guardians, which obviously is very essential to the parents. Um, but we also understand that, um, you know, we, we will bring a lot of people to come help. And uh, in Elk Grove, um, you know, there's different ways to unif reunify, and there's different ways to evacuate. Um, but uh, in Elk Grove, we have a system, we're gonna go through this here pretty quick um, on how we do it. But evacuation planning and pre-identification of potential reunification uh, areas are critical to how rapidly this can occur. Um, so you, you, you do want in your planning to pre-identify places. That doesn't mean we're gonna use e any of them, um, but if you have them pre-identified, we're able to um, go to you or go to your plan and say, hey, wh wh what, what relationships have you built with maybe um, you know, the church down the street or, or whatever the reunification location is and, and maybe there's already something in place. Now, again, there's a chance that we won't be able to use it for whatever the reason is. The emergency is, is so large that it's too close even, uh, you know, to reunify there or um, evacuate students or, and staff there. Um, it may be that it's downwind from, uh, you know, a gas main that's that's exploded um, so the, the, but having them pre-identified will 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 at, at least give you the us the ability to say hey what do you have where are we gonna put things and uh, that pre-planning is very very important um, but understand with the evacuation and reunification the reason we have this expectation that you get that the school administrators will do this is that we have our primary focus which is here on the screen, and, and that's dealing with the crime scene. And, and so we, um, with all that going on, and under the Unified Command, it's real, real important to 
uh, be on the same page and pre-plan uh, all you can and, uh, and again, uh, exercise it as well. Um, this slide illustrates that, you know, your, your pre-identified location could be right in the middle of those news vans. And that's quite, it's not uncommon that um, <laughs> by the time the news media gets there initially, we, we may, may or may not have the ability to tell them where to go. Um, so that could happen. That could be your pre-identified location like I was speaking to earlier where, um, you know, we can't use that. We, we can't reunify people there. We, we can't evacuate people there. So just understand that having a couple of locations is, is very important. Um, in Elk Grove, we have a tactical response vehicle, um, and it's, it, uh, it houses all of our, our information electronically throughout, throughout, throughout the district. Um, we also have a reunification trailer. Now, <clears throat> for our reunification trailer, we have a, a system, and again, understanding resources, and this has been a, a, a work in progress for several years, um, but um, again, understanding resources, you may not be able to have this, but it, it's just something to start to think about in terms of organizing uh, your reunification and your evacuation. We have these packets, and in these packets we have the lanyards. In fact, why, does, why don't everybody put the lanyard that you got on your neck right now, just for demonstration purposes? So. If you look on your lanyard, you have uh, a card in there that's a color, it's a color, and uh, I think they're all red, maybe 16 or 18, and they match these signs here. So the idea is, is this. Well, let me back up to the card. On the back of the card, there's information, for, uh, medical information, things like that, that the teacher can fill out. Um, what, what are our reunification plan does and evacuation plan does is we deliver these to the classrooms. This gives something for teachers to do while we're getting prepared to evacuate, occupies time. Um, it also gives kids something to do. Put their names on there, they have it on their, on their lan the lanyard on. Um, and at this point, we really encourage them if they're going to use that social media that we we're talking about and texting and things like that to um, tell their parent where they're gonna be. Once we identify the location that we're gonna reunify at, we put these signs up. So, Tracy, you are red 16. So you would call your, or text your mom, um, and say, mom, we're gonna, at my reunification point, I'm in red 16, so go to the sign that says red 16, I'll be there. It does two things, one, it, it, it at least relieves the parent's mind initially that you're okay, and it also gives them something to do. There was some talk about, well, what if we at, a, at the school just did an auto dialer and told all the parents don't come to the school? That ain't working, right? <laughs> They're gonna be on your doorstep. So this is a good way for them to get information fairly quickly um, and, and give them something, to give the parents something to do until we can get folks reunified, or kids reunified with their parents. Um, also, in, so we have packets of 50, and we have the individual life room survey in here as well. And what that does is, it, again, gives this is for the teacher to fill out uh, who they have in their classroom, uh, the student ID number, all that stuff, um, and, and assists with reunification. Once we have this list, we know who's in that group. We take them either by bus, walk them, however we get them to reunification location. And this um, is our accountability. Helps us account for every kid that's in that room once the lockdown happens. Um, additionally, some markers and things like that in the package. Um, we're able to evacuate 5,000 people if we need to. And we have, uh, in Elk Grove, we have some mega campuses with uh, multiple um, schools on a campus. And, up, and in the height of things, there were almost 5,000 kids between the two schools. So, that's kind of what we plan for, um, but this is what this is what it looks. This is exactly what it looks like when we reunify. We also have these things, witness cards. So if we um, know that somebody's a witness right away, we can identify them, and law enforcement can uh, go through that process of interviewing and things that we talked about in the earlier slide. 
Um, again, it, the, the trailer's uh, self-contained, has all the information in there. Um, it has all of our cards and lanyards. In fact, we have the trailer in Tahoe, Tahoe out here in the parking lot if at some point you want to go take a look uh, during the day. Uh, plan, prepare, and practice. This is, I think this is the key here. This is where you can help us, and we can help... We can, you can help us help you. Um, again, kind of a refresher, but I want to point out a couple of things. Um, as of January of 2012, um, the, the law changed and allowed you to elect to not put uh, disclosed portions of your comprehensive safe school plan. This thing, everybody knows what this is, right? All the components in here, you know, the one component in there that, that you don't have to, or the piece that you can take out, are the, the things that um, are your ta the tactical stuff, your, your site maps, if you, you know, have them in there, aerial photos, things like that that you don't want necessarily discovered by everybody. Because right now, if somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to see your comprehensive safe school plan, it's a public document, you have to show them. Um, <coughs> There in the handout, there's a FBI quick shooter or a quick guide of active shooter. Uh, I want to point out that in one of the statistics on the right hand side, the right column under statistics, 93% of, of attackers planned out the attack in advance. So, a little food for thought here. If they're plan, if 93% of them are planning it in advance, do you think that they might want to plan to look at your map of your school probably they probably want to look at your uh, your shutoff valves for your uh, utilities they want to see what your escape routes are right so as much as that stuff that you have in your comprehensive safe school plan under your under the emergency procedure guidelines that you can remove that and not give that out publicly now let me offer one other piece of uh, information up for you in in the world um, that I live in, I, I, if I were a bad guy, I would go on the internet to try to find that stuff too. If it wasn't accessible in this, and again, we recognize there's many components of this, and, that, and I'm, I'm, but we're speaking to the one, the one piece about the, the maps and, and tactical stuff. Um, but you, you may have your, your map of your school on, your, on the internet for parents to look at. Um, we recognize that, you, you know, back to school night, you have to provide those things, but you may, may want, we recommend taking it off the Internet. Don't put that on the Internet. Don't give the, 93 percent of them are, are pre, um, looking at your school in advance and, and, and pre-planning. Pre why, why give them that advantage? Um, and again, as superintendents and leaders of the schools, ensure, ensure that your, all your schools have um, updated comprehensive safe school plans. In, in emergency guideline, procedures guidelines. I know, they're done, I know you guys have had them out there, but a couple, you, you may want to think about looking at them again and taking that piece out that, that, doesn't, that the, the law says you can take out, and it's um, in the education code there. Um, and then have schools disseminate the plan, because what good is the plan? Somebody said it earlier, I think uh, Mr. Seller said it, if it's on a bind, in the principal's office in the binder. On, on the shelf and the principals let's say the principal is the only one that reviews it not very not very effective you want to get out to as many people as you can on your campus so that everybody knows what to do and how to respond um, again I, I touched on this earlier we, we have taken everything that all the school maps for all 64 of our schools now um, all the contact information, student information system, we're able to access through computers in the car and our tactical response vehicle. Um, we have all that electronically and decide to store it there for us. Um, it, an idea might be taking that stuff and putting it uh, for all of your schools in a maintenance truck that's maybe not, maybe uh, an extra maintenance truck that's not being used regularly or, um, you know, there's a ton of different ideas about how to do that. Um, but, the, uh, but the real main purpose is, is you want to have it accessible when it's needed, but you also don't want to necessarily keep it in where it's public information. 
Right now, we've just passed out our emergency, flip, uh, emergency response guidelines flip chart. This is the document that we use in Elk Grove, and it's standard throughout our district. We use this to get that information that this is our, our quick reference to our emergency procedures guidelines. This is in every classroom. We put it in the, the folders of substitute employees that come in to work for the day. Um, we're also using this to in our substitute employee training through our human resources department. So there's some ideas about how to get the information out. Um, again, it's, it's not really rocket science, honestly. It's just a way to get the information out to, to everybody so everyone knows how to respond. Um, again, it provides all personnel with the information in a user-friendly format and allows site members to easily access and follow guidelines to minimize potential dangers and possible, possible casualties. Talk about preparing and practicing. Prepare your school sites. Um, now they have, now every classroom has this in their, in their room and they know how to, what to do in, in response to any emergency. Um, but you also want to do the other things. You know, there's been a lot of talk about or questions about, well, do I lock all my gates or do I have the teachers lock all the doors or what do I do? Um, and, our, and our suggestion is do what you can given your resources, but understand you want to make ingress um, and egress controlled to non-staff to non members, yet allowing uh, escape routes to be accessed by all. So the idea is, is in Elk Grove, we, had a, we have a standard um, key for our padlocks for our gates. And so the teachers would have access to, to escape should there be a fire drill or things like that. Um, so we want to we want to contain it as much as we can, but not so much so that we're compromising the ability to escape when a fire happens or things like that. So it's kind of a balance, um, and, and again, it, it comes back to resources and and how how you go about doing it. But again, make sure that if you're doing that, you're also thinking about the egress portion of it, so that you're not locking people in and and so that and uh, so they have the ability to leave when they can. Um, practicing, so, so important. You can plan and you can prepare all you want, but if the kids don't know what to do when the lockdown drill is, is announced, that's where you're going to have a problem. Um, we recommend, lock, you know, practicing these drills, um, lockdown, evacuation, all the, all the drills that you have to. I know, you, I know there are some state laws that re require you to, to do certain things, uh, but we would, we would recommend that you have unscheduled and scheduled um, drills and uh, maybe maybe you have a scheduled drill once a month maybe you, you put on the calendar on th this day on this month we're going to do a, a lockdown drill and maybe it's two a, a week later two weeks later make it random um, and then do your do your <coughs> unscheduled drills in there as well um, you know it's hard it's hard to give you an exact way to do it but I but what I would suggest is by having your monthly drills maybe you do an unscheduled one every two weeks uh, for the first quarter and then the next quarter you do it every six weeks and just kind of randomly put it in there uh, but the idea really is, is to get that practice in so that when an emergency happens and you have to do the drill it will happen and kids will know what to do make it easy on staff because they're going to have a lot to deal with as well Make it easy on yourself. Get, get that practice in. Um, and, and again, do, do what you can on your campuses to prepare to keep intruders out, but also have the ability to, um, to, to escape when needed. Yes? Um, do you tell, just because of everything that's gone on, do you tell each time you have a drill that this is a practice drill? No. Now you just do a drill, and then when they hear the clear, then you're done. Um, it, it, if, you're, if, you're tell, if you're telling them we're going to do practice for the game, we want to make sure that they believe that it's the game. Um, now, if you, have, if you have a situation where you think that would create hysteria, um, you know your campus and the culture of your campus is better than I do. Um, definitely something you want to take into account. 
Definitely.